morning, everyone. So maybe you can't tell, but I don't have the mic, so we're using the mic that's on t the monitor, which is really bad. Uh, so you all are very lucky because you're experiencing this in good sound quality. When this goes up, it's going to be terrible. So uh, I'll try to restate your questions and all that because I'm not sure it's going to get everybody's uh, questions in. Uh, maybe a couple minutes for Project 3 questions. No, no Project 3 questions. Okay, on it. No. It's a trick to get you to ask questions. It didn't work. Ooh, it's because you're all done. Mm, nice. I like that. Yeah. Um, so based upon the way you did the first and process, I guess, really the classes, mm -hmm. you kind of did this run through each rule and then restart, run through each rule. How do we, how do we tell when we're done? I know it's when we check when there's no changing between mm -hmm. each pass through, but I'm not really sure on how to keep track of that. So what do you do when you're doing it by hand? Well, I just visually see that I don't think it's changed. Right. So, what are you com what are you comparing when you're doing that? Right, at each step. Changes. Changes in what? So you have. First and the first sets. Right. Let's say first sets. Right. So you go through, you calculate first sets. You compare it to the one right before it. Right. If there's been any changes, then you do it again. So I should ask him that, like, basically says if I make any statement that changes not, then. Yeah, there's kind of two different ways, right? So one way would be you have some flag that you set whenever there is a change, so you. You start, assume there are no changes, right. and then go through. Uh, that's actually a little, can be brittle, because you're applying these rules over and over again, right? Um, so one way to do it is to just do exactly what you're doing, right? I mean, by hand. So create a copy of the last time through of all the first sets, right? Then go through, calculate the new first sets, because you need those old copies, right, when you're, ca when you're calculating first sets. And then at the end, you just compare. You say, hey, you have a method that compares all the first sets and says, hey, has anything changed? And then if it has, then you know you have to do it again and keep going. Any other strategies for handling that? Yeah, in the back. Um, so I just wrote my first set of methods, and I guess I'm a little nervous that I have a recursive call to the first set. So because I have a rank like a large like first sets make all the oh, like a two dimensional vector of all mm -hmm. the first sets and that one's gonna call another method okay. that calculates a singular first set for one non terminal. Okay. Um, and so I basically wrote the rules into that like uh, that second method and one of the rules is hey I gotta look at getting the first set for another non terminal. So you end up with sort of recursion I'm not sure So what about an example like? Because the actual way you do it is sort of <coughs> What about that? Is this a valid context-free grammar? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right, so this is actually why in class, I mean, when we're doing it by hand, we don't actually do it recursively, right? Okay. We're doing it iteratively, and we're this is why we start with initialize all the first sets to the empty set, right? And then we go through, and every time we need a first set, we just look up what the last value is. So we're keeping it around. We're not uh, going through and recap and trying to actually recursively calculate the first sets for all of them, because then you get into this kind of a case uh, where you run into problems. Other questions? A minute. What's I doing here? Oh. Wait. It's a, yeah. I just wondering if there's any way, like, you should keep in mind designing it that might help us in the other projects, or is that just kind of like uh, the other projects are well, they deal with things in this class, but they don't directly build on top of each other, so you don't need to worry about it in that sense. You do need to worry about though, like. You need to make sure your first sets are correct, right, to do follow sets. Uh, that's one way it builds on top of it. Yeah? So the TA said that this would be the hardest project? That's what I've heard. I don't know. I think it depends on you 
individually. Like the other projects are also super cool, but this one I've heard is more difficult because you're starting from scratch. Yeah. Did you pass all the test cases for uh, the first sets with no epsilons? Mm -hmm. If you are writing the follow set correctly, should you pass all of the follow sets with no epsilons? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's the way you know that you've done first sets correctly without epsilons, right? And so then doing follow sets, if you're basing it on top of those with no epsilon, it should be, assuming you've done it correctly, it'll be fine. Cool. All right, so let's get back into, okay. Okay, so we've been talking about how we resolve functions. We've been talking about how do we go from a name, from an invocation of a function, to the actual function definition? Uh, so what does C++ use to do function resolution? Names, parameters, Yeah, name, number, parameters, and parameter types. Um, right, so uh, this is how it looks up which name, whereas in C it just uses the name. So if we have a C++ program that includes a header file, has a function foo that returns 10, has a function foo that takes in an integer x and returns 10 plus x, then if we're going to call foo, ah, so which instance of this foo is that going to resolve to? The first one, right? The compiler is going to see the name foo. It's going to say, okay, I see a function foo. How many arguments does this invocation of this function foo have? Zero. So it says, is there a function named foo with zero <laughs> arguments? Yes. Right here. So I know it's going to call that. And then, so then when it sees this invocation of a function foo, which function is this going to resolve to? The second one, yay. Right here, right? So it's going to say, oh, this is a function that has... Uh, one parameter, and that parameter is an integer, so I know which one to call. So what's this going to output? Hmm? So first question is, is it going to compile correctly? Yes, no, yes. Can one of them take parameters? I, I want to say yes. Because there is actual, there is a difference between the two. Right, so the function signatures here are different. So one is just foo, right? The name foo, parameter is zero, uh, no parameters. But the second one, the name is foo, the number of parameters is one, and the type of that parameter is an int. <laughs> Okay, so this compiles correctly, then what happens when I run it? What does this output? What does it do? 10, 20. So what's, the, what's test going to be? 10. 10 and bar is going to be 20. So we can do it and run it. Yay, okay. Any questions on function resolution? Cool. So is this independent of static dynamic scoping? Are they dependent? How are they related? Usually you try not to establish, uh, establish functions inside of other functions. That's who? Standard convention? Your language designer, yeah. But does it have to be like that? No, Python. No, in some languages like Python or JavaScript, actually a bunch of languages, you can define functions within functions. So if I could define a function foo inside main, where would that function be valid for? Inside main. Inside main, inside that block, right? Depending on the scoping rules. So still the scoping rules come into effect here. So this just resolves, how do we map this invocation of this function to the actual function <laughs> definition? But finding that function definition, right, uses the scoping rules. So it'll say, okay, if we're using static scoping, then we look in 
main scope, say is there a function foo declared? No. Then look in the global scope, it's parent. Oh, there's a function foo declared here. Uh, so these are you know, separate issues, but still very tightly linked. OK. So this is going to be something that is, again, <coughs> again going to seem pretty basic. But actually, when you get down to it, so what, what does assignment mean? So what do I mean by assignment? value to a variable, right? Like the equals in a lot of languages. But what are the exact, what does this mean? When I say, when you have a statement x equals y, what precisely does that mean? The value of y is associated with x. The value of y is associated with x? It depends on how you write x is being assigned What was that? x is being assigned to y. x is being assigned the value of y. means take the value. Something about the memory, put the memory in the Y with the memory of the X. <laughs> uh, it depends if it's a primitive or an object. Depends on if it's a primitive or an object, so what would the difference be, and in what language? Well, I guess if it's C++ and it's a primitive, it'll copy the value into the new memory location. Mm -hmm. Or if it's an object, it'll copy a reference to the address. Does that happen in C++ or Java? Java. Java. Definitely Java. You control what happens in C++. Yeah, yeah. you can tell it make a copy or just pass for That was just for So it just depends, kind of? <laughs> right? Um, I guess one thing is, in some languages, this actually isn't how you do assignment. This would be an equality check that says, is x equal to y? Right, like in, uh, I think in SQL, this is how you do equality. It's not a double equals. Uh, so really, it really depends on the programming language, right? What exactly happens here? What happens with pointers? What if they're pointers? What if there's values in there? What about if there's values associated with x and y? Um, so before we do that, we're going to define, so we need to be able to break this down, this uh, assignment semantics, int, and we need to be able to talk about them and understand them. So we're going to talk about four different things. So what's a name? In reference to like a variable like this. <coughs> Say it again, louder. <coughs> Does it have to point to a memory location? It does depend, right? So yeah, let's let's think of the name as kind of the high level, like the pro programmer's abstraction, right? It just gives a name uh, to something. So, and we can also say it refers to some declaration, right? So we know that this name uniquely maps to a specific declaration. But does the name have say anything about where this thing is stored? How it's stored? Is it stored in memory? Is it stored on the disk? Is it stored in a register? Is it stored? on, I don't know, what are some other things? Uh, in the network, on a cloud server, right? Like where is, I mean, so at a high level, we don't really care about that. We care about that name X or that name Y and where that is declared. Okay. So a location is, now we're getting a little bit closer to the hardware. And, but we're still going to think abstractly, so we're not going to think about necessarily memory, bytes, layout, all that kind of stuff. We're going to say that a location is some kind of container that can hold a value. And a binding is going to map a name to a location. Uh, so this is that association between, okay, the name X refers to some location, and that location inside of it can have a value, right? So what, what are values in our systems? It's kind of like the lowest level you could possibly go. Yeah, integers or, you know, it depends on the language, but let's say like C, right? It depends on the type of the variable, characters, integers, strings, 
uh, or actually character pointers, so it's characters once again. Okay. So, the way we're going to use to think about and understand the semantics between assignment statements and the relationship between these four values, between the name, the location, the binding, and the value. Uh, we're going to use what's going to look like something that's going to be kind of silly, but actually makes crazy pointer operations manageable and doable, and actually really helps how you think about these things. Uh, so we're going to use box circle diagrams, and they're exactly what they sound like. They have boxes and circles. Pretty easy, right? Don't even need to be an artist. Okay, so if we have in C, we have a declaration int x. So from this declaration, what's the name? X. X. So we need some way to represent, to, we need some way to associate these four values. So what's the value of x right now? Depends on the programming language. Depends on the programming language. So in C, what's the value of x? We don't know. It's undefined. Yeah, it's kind of tricky existential question. Like, does an undefined memory value exist? Uh, yes, it does exist, but when you use it, the behavior becomes undefined. So maybe it doesn't exist. I don't know. I'm not a philosopher. Uh, okay, so we're going to represent this with the name X. Incredibly simple part. And so we need to say that, okay, Depending on where this x is used, right, there's going to be some location in memory or in somewhere, but we actually don't care where it is. But we're going to use boxes to represent a location. So we're going to say, okay, we know that there's some location associated with x, and specifically we're going to use this binding to say, okay, x is bound to this location, some square box, and then inside that box, here's where the circle part comes in. We're going to draw a circle, and so whatever value is inside this circle is going to be the value associated with x. Seems pretty easy, right? Good. Okay. So, if we declared our int x, and then we say x is equal to 5. So how do we interpret this? What's the relationship here between this and our four values we're talking about? Yeah. So we're saying that our our variable named x is bound to a location containing the data value five. Almost. Very close. Um, we're not actually so in C, right? Where we have an in x, we have a declaration like this. We say x is bound to some location, that binding doesn't change in C, right? So here we're not changing the binding of X, but we're saying copy the value 5 where? Into the value at the location that X is bound. Yeah, copy the value 5 into the value of the location associated with the name X. Right? So we're saying, okay, we have an x, and then we have our 5, and so we're going to copy 5 into the value, uh, we're going to copy 5 into the value, uh, into the value of the location associated with the name x, and so after this executes, we're going to have 5 in here, in our box circle diagram. <laughs> so how do we know that 5 was a value? How do we know to let's like copy it in there? Where does 5 exist? Uh, in the base memory, like just... Like does 5 have a box? When I drew it here, does 5 have a box? No. Location associated with it? 5 is an immediate value. Created in memory? Or created, loaded, or created at a, um, execution time. Can we ever, I don't know, reference the location that this 5 is? No. 
No, right? It's, it's just a value. It just exists, right? It's a value that exists that has no location, no box associated with it. It's conceptual. Yes. <laughs> so we're saying, and this is why it's, so kind of what comes to mind is like an immediate value. Like it's, it's, it's a value, right? So we take that value and we copy it into the location associated with the name X. So how is this different than, we have a case here of int X, int Y, X is equal to Y. Right, so yeah, what's the semantics of this? X equals Y. Copy the value of Y into the value of X. Right, so copy the value in the location associated with Y to the value in the location associated with X, right? So how many circle box diagrams do we have here? Two, right? Y actually has a location and a value. So we have X and Y. And we're going to take whatever's in Y and copy it into the value associated with X. What if I do this? Does this change things? No. What does this mean? You're saying copy the value. This. Copy the value at the location associated with X into the value of the location associated. The location associated. Yeah, same thing, right? So I just copy this value and copy it into here. Right. So it's the same thing as we saw before. Okay. So what's the difference between an L value and an R value? <laughs> You've heard those terms before? Left and right, actually, which is really terrible. So what's an L value versus an R value? Why is it important? Yeah, you can guess. It's okay. It's not. You know. Let's go back here. So an L value, the L and R indicates being on the left side and the right side of the quality or assignment. Mm-hmm. That was very good. Cool. All right. So, L value, R value, right? The difference here is what goes on the left hand side of an assignment operator. Can I have something like this? But why not? Why can't you do this? Right, because five has no location associated with it, right? Five is just a value. You can't assign into five. There's no, five is, another way to put it, an immediate value, right? There's no way to change that or do that or put anything in there. So then is this valid? Yeah, right? So then what type of value is x? An L value. Yeah. And r uh, 5 is an r value. So, uh, and this is kind of the way to think about this and to keep this, uh, because is it very obvious that you can do this? I mean, that you can't do this, right? 5 is equal to x. I think we all kind of intuitively, from our the years you've spent programming, you kind of know you can't do this. It doesn't make sense, right? But this helps us answer the question. Can I do that? This is the ad. This is uh, the ampersand sign. Yeah. Yes. You could. You could. Probably won't get anything productive out of it. You can do it in C. Can you? Well, I think it'll Have you tried it? I think it might be undefined behavior, but you could do it. So that's what that is. 
It's a little messed up, but that's I, I can't think of a, of a reason you would ever want to do that, but I know that you can well, do that in C because I've, I've done exactly that, screwing up linked lists. I, I think it's just like, yeah. Yeah. So what does it depend? So how do we know if we can or cannot do that? Depends on how you declare x. Depends on how you declare x. So can, is this valid? Can I do this assignment? L value is equal to some L value? Yeah. So how many combinations of this am I going to write? Four. Four. Good. Can I do this? L value is equal to R value? You know how to do that? Yeah. <clears throat> can I do this? Not always. Are there some times that I can? If the R value has a location. And if it has location, it would be an L value. Oh. <laughs> what about this one? Can I do this? <laughs> no. I, I thought R values could or could have a well, they could or couldn't, right. then. But if we know that they do. What do you mean if? If we know, how do we not know? Are we ever not gonna know? What, can we flag it as what? What was the other question? It would just be a flag. It would just be a. Say it again. What's the difference between these two? So I can do this, right? Definitely, like this is it's absolutely what equality does. But can I do this? Can I do this? That's the same thing. No? Somebody said depending on the language. That yeah. is true, I guess. But five could be. I feel like it's a terrible idea. It's mm -hmm. possible, actually. Wait, it's right here. It's like, not because five doesn't have location. Yeah, so what type of value is it? <laughs> it's an R value, right? It has no location associated with it. So can you do either of these two? No, because you're saying assign the L value the value at the location of the R value. Yeah, the, the assignment is put the, whatever the value and the location associated with this into the, well, where do you put this? It has no location. It's just a value, right? In that diagram when we said x equals 5, right, we had x at our box in our circle, and we have 5 outside. 5 is just a value. It doesn't have a, lo there's no location associated with 5, so we just copy 5 and put it into here. So, so the R value is always an actual value? Yes. Okay. An L value has a location associated with it. That's the way to think about it. Okay. Um, so if there's location associated with it, it's an L value. If there's no location associated with it, then it's an R value. Well, I was thinking um, in, in the second line, L mm -hmm. value equals R value, mm -hmm. the R value is still Okay, okay, so if that R value had a location, it would just... It would be an L value, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's think about that, and then let's kind of keep this in our heads. Right? So how would we know if we could do this or not? If, if, it, if that is like either the first one or the second one. Yes, exactly. It depends on what this address of operator does. Does it return an L value or an R value, right? And that's the key idea 
that's why we're looking at what is L values and R values. It's very trivial when we look at, well, X's and 5's, right? But when we have pointer operations, it gets to be a little bit more tricky. Uh, so we need to think about that a little bit more. So let's go back and let's look at the, the assignment semantics here. So we have L value is equal to R value, right? So we kind of already said this. So an expression is an L value if there's a location associated with the expression. So why am I using expression here? What's an expression? Uh, let's see. Uh, is this an expression? Is that an expression? Yeah. Yeah. Is just this thing an expression? No. Is this an expression? The whole thing an expression? Yeah. yeah. Is this an expression? With the star? Yeah, with the star. What's the star here? The pointer the, the dereference. Yeah. Is this an expression? So is this an expression? Yep. Yeah. So can you put expressions? Where can you put expressions? Can you do is so would this be like a general, let's say uh, assignment statement syntax? We called this our context-free grammar for assignment statements. Can you have expressions on the left-hand side? Yeah, you can do the address and reference and that kind of stuff. Why not? Can you just do this? X plus 5 is equal to... Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so wait, wait, okay, just a second. Let's go with this. Uh, we'll say like assignment is expression equals expression, right? So what are some things that can be expressions? Uh, yeah. So just like an int. What else can be expressions? Uh, let's call it IDs first, right? IDs. So just X. Right. What else can be expressions? So what do we say? So mathematical operations. What's like on the left of the plus? Expression plus expression. Right. And then we have or expression times expression. And then we have all of our other math operators. Yes. Uh, we also have right pointer dereferences, so we can have star expression. Uh, we can have an expression is the address of operator. So like any operator. No. So I'm going to have <coughs> Can I write this? So is it valid syntactically? If we're using background, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, actually, I don't know if the C grammar actually supports this or not. I think it would. Yeah. What can an expression not be? What can what? Say that again. What can an expression not be? Uh, it's an example of something it's not. Yeah. 
or actually, uh, no, because there's no operator here. If you did x plus 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 5, I think it may work. What if um, it's like x plus, that's it. That would not be it. Right. Is this an expression? Um, let's see. I was going to do equals, but actually equals is an expression itself. Right, x equals y, you can use this, like plus 10 or something crazy like that. <laughs> this is the cause of a lot of C errors. Hmm? So, go back to here. So, is it syntactically valid? Is it semantically valid? Probably not. Why not? Or why? Because you're just setting a value equal to a value. Which, it's... it's to R so what is the thing of this expression on the left hand side? A value. It's an, an R value. L value. Is it an L value or an R value? An R value. It's an R value. Isn't that right? X plus five. Is there any location associated with X plus five? No. No, right? I'm just doing math. I'm just taking the value that's in X, adding five to it. But there's no location associated with it, right? So this boils down to uh, R value is equal to, what's the right hand side? What kind of L value, R value? R value. Right, and so is this allowed semantically? No, there's no way to do this. No. Okay, so that's why when we look at these rules, we're gonna look at what the semantics are, and we're gonna talk about variables. Okay, so we've talked about an expression as an L value if there's a location associated with that expression, right? So does the expression x have a location associated with it? Yeah. Yeah, right. We draw, we have x, x is bound to a location, right? Is x plus 5 have a location associated with it? No, it doesn't make sense, right? There's no location associated with x plus 5. Okay, so then what's an R value? Something with have a location or with a location. Uh, yeah, so basically no location, so just a value, basically. So, um, so then x equals 5. So what, is this an L value equals to an R value? Yeah, so what are the semantics here? So generally with the L value and R value, right? What does that what does it mean? Oh, um, Don't talk about X's and fives. We want to talk about L values. Yeah, right? So copy the value in R value to the location in L value, right? So then can we do five equals X? No, oh, because there's no location, right? There's no location. So it's not semantically valid. Good. Okay, what if we have an L value 1 and L value 2? What do the semantics of this mean? Copy the value in L value 2 to the location in L value. Yeah, so copy the value and location associated with L value 2 to the location associated with L value 1, right? This is exactly what this means. So when I do things like a is equal to b plus c. So what's a? L value or r value? L value. L value. Uh, b plus c? It's an r value, right? So what we're going to do is the, the r value is the value. So the way to decode this, right? So the r value of b plus c is the value in the location associated with b plus the value in the location associated with c adding them together is a value, right, that has no location associated with it, right? We're doing computation. We're taking these, adding these two things together. And so, semantically what this means is copy the value associated with B plus C to the location associated with A. Questions on this? Okay. To go through why this would be useful, right? The question is, if I have, let's say I have an x. We're not even going to give them types right now. I have a y. 
and a b, I don't know, something like that. I say x is equal to the address of y and b is equal to uh, d reference of y star star of y and then I say something like I don't know y is equal to the address Let's see how many times can I do that oh like the address of b and we could keep going on so question could be like what's the what is the values in x b and y right what's the circle box diagram for this whole thing so we've done assignment, right? But now what do we need to cover to be able to understand what's going on here? Basically what, what each symbol means as to where, our, where we, how we draw our arrows in the diagram. Yeah, so what does what things mean? What's that called? Semantics, which is our topic, yes. Full circle. Yes. Cool. <laughs> All right, had to do that. All right. So the address operator. So what kind of an operator is this? How many arguments does it? So think of it like a function. Yeah, so how many arguments does it take? One. Just one? All right, so it's a unary operator. What does it return? The address of whatever ID you get. Yeah, so, uh, so then think about types in terms of L values and R values. So what can you apply the address of operator to? Uh, L values. An ID. What about R values? Can you apply it to an R value? No. R value doesn't have a location. Yeah. Can you take the address of 5? No. No, because there's no location associated with 5. Yeah. Right? So if you think about types, right, the input to the address of operator has to be an L value. And so what does it return then? Basically, like in the box circle diagram, where the box is at. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. So it's going to return an R value, right? And what's the type of this R value? Now, if we think about types. So let's say the type of the operand is some type T, like int. What's the type of the return value? T star. Yeah, T star. T -star. Yeah. Right? It's going to be a pointer to an int. Right? But it's going to be an R value. So it's very important. So what is this value? So we talked about it. Like what, you know, we can go a little bit closer to the metal, like in C. So what is this value supposed to be? An address. An address. What is an address? I mean. Right. So the address. So the value that it's going to return is the address of the location associated with the L value that the address of operator was applied to. So in, in, our, in the case of T, if it return type T star, it would return T of whatever, whatever the name is. Yeah, so let's look at, let's see if I can go in here. This note, you guys can see that. As an R value? Yes. Okay. So you, so you couldn't do like exactly. address equal to... Okay, so let's say I have in X equals 5. Now, what's my circle box diagram here going to look like? X, X points to a box. box. No pointing. X is bound to a box. Bound to a location. And what's the value inside that location? 5. OK. What's the address of this location? Do we care? No, so let's give it some abstract value alpha, right? It doesn't really matter what it is. So then, if later on I say the address of x, what's this going to return? Alpha, right? So it's going to return the address of this location associated with x. Okay, so if I have this, so let's go like this first. And then I have y is equal to the address of x. So, what's my circle box diagram for this declaration? So, you have y bound 
actually, well, first it's bound to nothing, so it's just a box with no value in it. And then, uh, the, the... Just this line. Okay, just that line is that. Just this? I would agree, but it's a pointer. Shouldn't there be like some other thing here that points to some other thing? But uh, that's not defined yet. So. Exactly, right? So this is one of the things you have to kind of get clear in your head, right? The fact that this is a pointer just only matters for types, right? It's an int star, it's a pointer. But y is just a, it's just a name, it has a name y, it's bound to some location that at the start has no value in it, right? There's nothing in there. So when I get to this next line, so what type of assignment operation is this? What are the types of the left hand and the right hand side? Uh, types and like L values, R values. So y is what? An L value, and what's the whole expression on the right-hand side going to be? An R value. An R value. So what's this going to do? How's this going to affect my circle box diagram? Well, it's not. It's going to leave X alone because it's not actually. It's not actually doing anything other than acknowledging X exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the value at the location associated with Y is going to contain the address of the box associated, the location associated with that. Right, so the address of x, so what's that going to return, what's the r value that's going to be returned here? Alpha. Alpha. And so I have l value is equal to r value, so what are the semantics there? So uh, it'll copy alpha into the location bound to r. Yeah. Right, so copy alpha, so take that r value alpha, put it in the location associated with y. Right, alpha here. So does it matter what is in here? Cool. Okay. Then let's think about, so the opposite of this kind of is point, is the dereference operator, right? So what are the, what's the type of this operator if we think about it as a function? Uh, what does it take in as input and what does it return as output? Some T star. How many arguments does it take in? One. One argument? Um, oop, oop. Okay. So can it be applied to L values, R values? Yeah, so actually either. So the restrictions are can be applied to an L value or an R value of type. Type T star. Right, and so, what does it return? <laughs> Returns a value. An R value. An L value. Either all five. So can we do this if we say after here? Can we do this? Yeah. Have you written programs that do this? Absolutely. So then what does it have to return? <coughs> An L value, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise this wouldn't this wouldn't be semantically valid. So what does it return then? So yes, it returns an L value, but what does it return? What was that? T? Uh, yeah, so if y is t star, the type will be t. Yeah, but what does it return? Which is the association? Right, so what is this doing? Right, so, okay, at the end result, what is this going to change in our diagram here? Where the x is here? I mean, I mean, the, the five. The, yeah. yeah. No. So the value at the value bound to ten. We're going to change the value of five to ten. Of whatever.
whatever is at the location. Does the dereference operator change anything? No. What does just this do? This expression. Access, access the value of location at the address of y. The address of y is beta. At the value stored in y. At the value stored. <laughs> at the address stored in the value of y. There we go. Why is this at the value stored in the address of y? Do we need to know the address of y? Do we need to know anything about beta? Not really. At, at, at the value of y. All right. So the way to break this down is take the value associated with y and return the location associated with that. Right? So here, this alpha, return the box associated with alpha. So star y refers to this location. And then when we have an L value, right, this is the L value. So we can set this L value to be 10, right? We know how to do that. We just take 10, copy the value as 10 to the location associated with this L value, which is right in here. Okay. We're going to go much more in depth on this and see exactly how to draw the box circle diagrams, but we'll stop here for today. Can you say that one more time? So if no. Is you take, <laughs> take the value associated with y and return y. Ah, you return the, L, the location associated with the value of y. So you're actually returning basically the box. 